Welcome back to our walk in Christ and our continuation of the prophet Micah. So we have probably two weeks left. We're going to split up Micah chapter seven. Today we're going to do verses one through seven. The old shall pass away. And of course, it's going to end with some discussion on the millennial reign, the ultimate defeat of evil. Uh, but we will get into that next week. And then we're going to have a little bit of a break. I believe as long as the quality of the sermon is good, I delivered a sermon a couple of months ago at a church I was visiting. And uh, as long as the quality of that is good, we will release that before we get into our next prophet, which will be Haggai. And that will be quite a uh, fun prophet to see what is going on there. But today what we're going to do is talk about the old shall pass away. And before we get there, you can have a look over the website at ourwalkinchrist.com. If you want to get a chance to have a look at what uh, is over there on the website, you can do that. And um, in light of all of that, uh, we're going to uh, jump on over and get started. All right. So in this chapter here, what we see is the older is going to pass away because of the sins. So the land is defiled with evil all around, but uh, there will come a final ultimate vindication as the few righteous, the remnant of Israel will be saved while the sinners are put in line by the ultimate ruling judge. So we're going to go ahead and start in with, um, uh, verses 1 through 6 as a whole, and then we're going to break this down a little bit. So Micah chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Woe is me, for I am like the fruit pickers, like the grape gatherers. There is not a cluster of grapes to eat or a first ripe fig which I crave. The godly person has perished from the land, and there is no upright person among men. All of them lie in wait for bloodshed. Each of them hunts the other with a net. Concerning evil, both hands do it well. The prince asks also the judge for a bribe, and a great man speaks the desire of his soul. So they will weave it together. The best of them is like a briar, the most upright like a thorn hedge. The day when you post your watchmen, your punishment will come. Then their confusion will occur. Do not trust in a neighbor. Do not have confidence in a friend. From her who lies in your bosom, guard your lips. For son treats father contemptuously. Daughter rises up against her mother. Daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own household. Of course, this is a portion that Jesus quotes from talking about things that will happen in the end days. But what we see in verses 1 through 6 is that the land is suffering. The land itself is suffering from unrighteousness. Something we need to keep in mind as we're moving through the West. Just literally forcing, forcing sin onto people. As we do this the land itself will begin to spew us out. Is this not the reason we're having a lot of these disasters? I'm not sure it's us sprinkling a few little pieces of uh, CO2 into the atmosphere necessarily. I think there's a lot more divine implication behind some of it. That being said, let's go ahead and break this down. Let's look first at verse 1. Woe is me, for I am like the fruit pickers, like the grape gatherers. There is not a cluster of grapes to eat or the first ripe fig which I crave. So he is going out there doing their harvesting, and there's still nothing to eat. The prophet goes to the land. He's looking for comfort, but he finds none. All right. He is, uh, the good old days are past the plants are no longer bearing fruit. Uh, we see elements of this uh, also talked about in Peter as he's discussing these false prophets coming in. And uh, he uses some of these descriptive, 2 Peter 2.17. These are springs without water and mists driven by a storm for whom the black darkness has been reserved. For the false prophets give us false hopes just as clouds and mirages in the desert. 
Of course, in Matthew 21, 18 and 19, we talk of a fig tree. Now in the morning, when he was returning to the city, he became hungry. Seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only. And he said to it, no longer shall there ever be any fruit on you. And at once the fig tree withered. Now there's some nuance in the story. It's uh, also reported in Mark and uh, I think also in Luke. Uh, but there's there's a few other elements added to the story. One of those is that this was not the season for figs. Yet he goes to it looking for figs in a season there are no figs. It's an illustration indicating that the tree looked full. It looked like it was good. It looked like it would bear fruit, but it wouldn't. Why? It's not in season. This parable is told in the midst that he is talking about end times and not that no one can ever know anything about the day or the hour, but he says there are signs to be looking for. True, nobody knows the exact day or the exact hour, but there are signs pointing to the coming. And we are at that. Are we paying attention to the signs? Are we walking in light, as it says later in this chapter, or in darkness? The fig tree had no fruit despite looking like it might. It fails to satisfy. Of course, in the parallel story, he pronounced the curse and they didn't notice the withering until the following day. Just something else, just a little nuance of the story. Uh, but that's really what the prophet is looking at here is there are all of these harvesting going on, but nothing is actually producing any fruit. It's like the frustrated farmer who just can't figure it out. He's doing everything right, but nothing is coming out of the ground. Uh, you know, maybe uh, God is the one responsible for the growth. In verse 2, Micah 7, 2, the godly person is perished from the land. There is no upright person from among men. All of them lie in wait for bloodshed. Each of them hunts each other with a net. So this is, I mean, a lot of ways, this is our current world where most people out there are just looking for how they can get the above average over the next other guy out there. And many people now are doing it with video cameras, running prank channels, or or just trying to be personally offended to go viral online. It's this mental illness creeping throughout our world. Uh, but that's what happens when all of these godless people are seeking to destroy others for no cause. I mean, look at the look at the guy who's trying to cancel me from the internet. The guy is an absolute. He is an absolute irrational human being who has nothing better to do than spend their life literally digitally stalking somebody, trying to paint him in the worst possible light. This is exactly this person. The godly has perished from the land. There's no upright. All of them are lying in wait for bloodshed. We're all copy and pasting little clips to make somebody sound as bad as they possibly are. They're lying in bloodshed, hunting each other with a net. That is what is going on. Of course, there's parallels to Genesis 6. The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth, that every intention, the thoughts of his heart was evil continually. Oh, that's true. Of course, Isaiah 59, 7. Their feet run to evil and they hasten to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Devastation and destruction are in their highways. So Isaiah talks of it. God talks of it, looking at the corrupt nature of man's heart. Jeremiah speaks of it, 526. For the wicked men are found among my people. They watch like fowlers lying in wait. They set a trap. They catch men. And of course, as Paul so eloquently puts it in Romans 3, 10 through 18, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they've become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness, and their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Indeed, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all condemned to death except when we repent and accept that sacrifice of Christ and turn our lives towards repentance and start doing the things God says to do, that 
is our only hope. And then the old shall pass away, and behold, all things new will come. But in this time, in this time of evil in Israel, Micah goes on, Micah 7, 3, concerning evil, both hands do it well. The prince asks also the judge for a bribe, and a great man speaks the desire of his soul, so they weave it together. So they're all looking for bribes. They, everyone is seeking all forms of evil. The bribes are coming in. The bribes are coming in. It's so bad. I mean, the New Testament reports one in such case. Acts 24, 24 through 27. This is, of course, Paul is in prison and he's being brought before Felix repeatedly. In some of the days later, Felix arrives with Drusilla, his wife, who was a Jewish, sent for Paul to be heard to speak about faith in Jesus Christ. But as he was discussing the righteous self-control and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened and said, go away at present. When I find a time, I will summon you. At the same time, too, he was hoping that money would be given to him by Paul. Therefore, he also used to send for him quite often and converse with him. But after two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcus Festus and wishing to keep the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. So here Felix keeps on bringing Paul, hoping that Paul gives him a bribe. Of course, Paul never does. He's like, yeah, I'll talk about Jesus all you want. As far as money, nah, I'll give you what I have, the knowledge in God. But this is just an example. Uh, this is a longer passage here from Luke 16, 1 through 9. Uh, so we're not going to read through all this uh, in, in full. But this is, uh, this is the shrewd serpent, or the shrewd uh, steward, if you remember. So he's caught... Uh, being dishonest, so he goes out to all of his master's creditors and tells them to write down his bills really quick so that when he departs and, and doesn't have a job, at least now he has friends among the scoundrels of the world. Uh, it's again, it's gain for unrighteousness. Interesting things. Of course, there's controversy. Why is this man praised at the end? Well, he's, he's praised at the end for using the world system to benefit himself. Um, which is certainly something that goes on in our modern world for sure. Now, in Micah chapter 7, verse 4, the best of them is like a briar, the most upright like a thorn hedge. The day when you post your watchmen, your punishment will come. Then their confusion will occur. So the most righteous of people are still unrighteous. Think about that. Like this is this idea of modern relativity. You know, we're talking about all this relativity and, and this is true for you and true for you. Well, in a, in a society of relativity, even the most righteous person by God's standard is extraordinarily unrighteous. Even the most righteous person in our standard is still unrighteous according to like, you know, 50s religiosity, uh, if you're talking about the moral conduct, of course, the moral conduct is not what saves us. But the reality is all of us still, again, from Romans 3.23, all of us have fallen short and sinned against God. We all fall short of that glory. And so because of this, uh, as we all fall short, and of course, uh, in Genesis 6.5, once again, the wickedness of us is after continually, uh, evil continually, the thoughts of men are evil continually. No one can be trusted, even as a guard. That's what's going on here. The guards are failing at their duty. I mean, we can think of a guy that definitely didn't kill himself. Uh, recently, all of the guards suddenly go out. All at the same time, all the cameras stop working. Wow, all these amazing coincidences for this guy that apparently is not well, just decides to, you know, not... Uh, uh, not uh, end himself. And so it, think of that. We are in this time that is so unrighteous. We cannot even trust the guards to do what is right. And so uh, Micah 7 verses 5 and 6, it culminates in this. Do not trust in your neighbor. Do not have confidence in a friend. From her who lies your bosom, guard your lips. For son treats father contemptuously. Daughter rises up against mother. Daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And man's enemies will be the men of his own household. Society has so corrupted itself. You cannot trust your neighbors. You cannot trust your friends. You cannot trust your family. We are getting to that world, especially as we have these Marxist ploys to take over the world and push that ideology. Remember 1984, the most 
common cause for being dragged off by the government was your children snitched on you at school. Are we seeing elements of that today? Indeed, we are. It's very interesting. Jeremiah 9, 4, let everyone be on guard against his neighbor. Do not trust any brother because every brother deals craftily and every neighbor goes about as a slanderer. We are in a world like this. We are in a world where we were taught back a couple years ago to call the police if your neighbor had one too many cars in their driveway. That is crazy. We are, I mean, I was excluded from family events, not that I really cared, uh, because I did not want to uh, in- inject certain substances into my body based on the fact, you know, I kind of have a PhD in biomedical research and I was reading the journal articles and I said, mm, I don't know, I don't know about this one. Especially since the consequences weren't there. The craftiness of the world. Matthew 10 34 through 36. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. <laughs> think about that next time. It's like, it's all about unity. No, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother, a daughter in law against a mother in law, and man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Directly quoted why? Because when you stand on truth, division naturally happens. It's not that we're seeking to divide, but when we have to stand up on truth, we have to stand up on the gospel, we are going to cause conflict. He says in another place, Matthew 10, 21 through 23, brother will betray brother to death. A father, his child, children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. But you will be hated because of my name. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. But whenever they persecute you in one city, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel until the man, uh, the Son of Man comes. So if we stand for truth, we will be persecuted. If we stand for Christ, they will come after us. This is true. And this is what has to happen before the final end days. But then those old ways will pass. Our last verse from Micah, Micah 7, 7. As for me, I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Before I get into my notes, I really want to focus on this, uh, just this thought. Because when the whole world is against you, but you know you stand for God, not just, I just feel it in my heart, but you have read the whole of scriptures so many times. You understand what is coming. You understand what is true. You understand that even if the whole world says a stupid thing, it is still a stupid thing if God says the contrary. All right? I am in good company walking with the prophets. The prophets who were persecuted, they were slain, they were torn in two, all of these things. I am in good company walking with the prophets, standing on the true word of God, not falsities, not playing the cultural game, not involved in all of this other nonsense. I am justified in following my God, having read the scriptures and understand the whole of the scriptures, seeing what is coming, seeing the overtaking, seeing how they are trying to destroy the last free countries with Marxist ideology, which seeks to destroy and enslave. You see, as for me and my house, as Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. In fact, that is my next verse. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your father serve, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I will wait expectantly. I will persevere to the end. Are you going to do the same? Looking ahead to God, your Redeemer. Because remember the contrary, Romans 1, 21 through 25. Even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. 
Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, so their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. There is a God. He has made himself known. The question is, are we going to follow him? The consequences will come from God, and in this case, it is exactly what has happened. The old has passed away, but as we get into our next portion, the final conclusion of Micah, the whole book, the final conclusion of Micah, there is a remnant who is saved because of their faithfulness. But of course, their faithfulness is because God has set them apart. He has chosen them in his sovereign election, and they in turn, persevere. So if you have not already repented, today is the day of salvation. Repent of your sins. Turn to Christ. Get a Bible and start reading it. I would recommend you start in the New Testament. Read maybe one of the Gospels and then one of the longer church letters and a couple of the shorter church letters. Read through the New Testament a couple times. It will not take more than a a couple of weeks to read it if you spend, you know, 15 minutes, half hour a day, you can read the New Testament a couple times in the next few weeks and then get into the old and understand how the Old Testament relates to the New Testament. Seek the whole of scriptures as you seek to understand it. Recognize that it is only the sacrifice that Christ has given us, which sets us apart. With that, thank you for watching and I hope that you enjoy your daily walk in our Lord. (laughs) 